Hello and uh, welcome along. It's Andy, um, your host on this here podcast. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Wedding Professionals podcast, uh, now available on Spotify and Google Podcasts and Amazon. At time of recording, still waiting for verification from iTunes and um, Ask Alexa whatever that is, I have no idea. Um, hopefully um, you're all being entertained by the conversations that I'm going out and recording uh, and people are finding it interesting and, you know, dare I say, entertaining. Um, hopes, I hope you are. And if so, then please stick with it. We've got plenty more people lined up and if you're an industry professional yourself and you'd like to um, take part, uh, then as I always, I keep banging the drum. Get in touch with me, Andy at jibstv.com, J-I-B-Z-T-V.com, uh, and we'll look forward to um, maybe getting you on in the future and drag you aboard um, this rocky ship. <laughs> so back to today's episode. Um, sorry, Jas, didn't give you any sort of introduction because we were just so busy chit-chatting away and I completely omitted to give him any sort of introduction whatsoever. Um, so if you're listening back to this, Jas, which I doubt, but if you are, uh, then welcome to the Wedding Professionals Podcast. So you had a life in media, a bit like Amar, uh, before yeah, yeah. and everything started. So yeah, talk, yeah. talk to me about that a little bit. So it kind of, um, everything started through music. Every, everything revolves around the passion for music. Even the business we do today, it's all still revolves around passion for music. I think that's why we're still in it. Um, and it kind of started from there. We H was literally blew up on the scene where he'd done this massive uh, album called Reloaded. And then now, and at that time, we just started Kudos, I was like 22 years old, just finished uni, thinking what the hell I'm going to do in my life. And then Amar had been, he's always been really close mates with H. They've been mates for a long time. And then uh, H was doing a behind the scenes video for Miss Pooja's, uh, tracking on Miss Pooja. And um, Amar used to be into video camera. And uh, there was a girl that was supposed to come and present it who didn't turn up. And they were like, Jazz, oh, you're pretty confident. Do you want to do it? I said, all right, come on in, we'll do it. Done the uh, behind the scenes thing. And at that point, Brit Asia just came onto the scene and it literally exploded and reloaded was massive. Kudos was just opening. And then this behind the scenes thing just went huge. Um, and then Brit Asia said, like, do you want to do a show? And me and Amar were like, yeah, go on then. Like, we've both got nothing going on in our lives. So uh, bought a camera, had no money, just come out of uni, um, put, got my mum to get a camera for me. Um, and then, yeah, just started touring with H, uh, going around and then done this show called Night Shift. And we ended up going from just touring in like London clubs to interviewing Amita Bachchan and um, flying around the world and doing shows in Dubai and India. And it, it just grew massive and I think everything had its harmony because Kudos was coming oh, we we just started Kudos H's album was big then this show went massive and it was like everything just worked in such a synergy that uh, it just worked for us yeah and then it uh, and then that's it that was it. and then Amar ended up learning how to edit on the job yeah. he was never an editor he was if you know obviously you're friends with him he was actually he actually studied I think direct being a director um in uni in his media uh, uh thing so uh yeah that's it really that's how it kind of all went about but yes yeah, so that would have been about 12 13 years ago something like that 22 so i'm what oh, i'm old now man 36 try being 62 yeah i know man not as old as you Andy. but yeah we'll see um yeah about 13 14 years ago yeah because i remember taking a photo of kudos one of my very first jobs probably 12 years ago yeah, yeah. and it was just like back projectors and screens and yeah, yeah. and a really you know ha handmade kudos sign. yeah so yeah nothing like it is now yeah yeah i've just like <clears throat> you've just given me a tour around the facility here and it is mind blowing i've got to say like the amount of kit that you've got uh, the amount of the attention to detail on like those tables you've got around the back there, everything's yeah. clean, everything's tidy, everything's polished, everything's put back neatly. Um, it, it's just an incredible operation. I've got to say, it's, it just it just blew me away, really. And the print side of it as well, massive printers and all yeah. sorts of stuff here. So um, it must be an absolute nightmare to manage. How do you how do you do it? You know, 
it's actually not a nightmare. Uh, one thing I've realized, um, obviously I'm a, just going, as we go, I'm learning about business every day. I'm still, you know, never know. You, you can never stop learning. I think that's one thing you have to respect. And another thing you have to appreciate is that your skills aren't going to be as good. Just because you employ someone doesn't mean you're better than them. Their skills you have to respect. So yeah, you employ someone for that area, but I actually... You, yeah, putting the infrastructure together was really hard, like in terms of getting the systems in place and and understanding the kind of logistical side of getting everything working together and all the cogs to work together. But the team we've got make it not difficult. Like some of the people we've got in this team, like we're like a family. So um, they all treat the business with the same love and ownership as myself. Um, and it's not it's actually not a hard thing to run. How many people do you actually employ then? So before COVID, we were 44 staff. Um, we are less than that now. Uh, I think the problem at that time was we were growing so quickly and we were so um, unaware of, you know, we just throwing manpower at things because things were coming at us so quick, like, oh, add print, add this, add that, add that. And we were troubleshooting so much, trying to manage everything. Um, we grew into this animal that was actually uncontrollable at the time. And weirdly enough, as much as the events industry got hit really bad, uh, COVID was a blessing for us, like literally enabled us to take a step back, reassess the whole business and think, okay, we're um, overstaffed. We're basically doing things for nothing. Um, and we need to be a bit more selective about firstly, who we employ. And secondly, um, getting a culture of, oneness in the company because what happened as we were adding aspects of the business like we started off as an av company added workshop added print the print company was like oh but that's not my job they're in uh, they're in design no that's not my job they're in uh, carpentry that's not my job they're in this so i don't want that when we came back from covid i was like guys if you work for kudos you work for kudos you don't work in your workshop you don't work in your print we load the vans together we unload the vans together the fight is between all of us to get things done. When you're doing four days in a row in the middle of August, when it's scorching unbearable heat, I want all of us to pull together and do it. So COVID en enabled us to bring back the core cool people that we wanted to keep. Um, and now we employ, I think about on full-time staff, I think about 22. Uh, but obviously now we have a lot of casual, not casual, but like freelance work, but really good freelance workers that understand and are in quite involved in our business. So on a weekend, we could have 200 staff working for us okay. week on week. So it's very, it, it, it's become more about more freelancers and a good pool of them that are also passionate about but the company. But you can know and, and yeah. trust to, um, to do the job yeah, right, yeah. I suppose, yeah. Um, just looking on the um, Kudos website, uh, I think I counted 17 DJs. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So AJ, uh, AJD, Amon K, Amraj, Amx. N. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. All oh, these new kids. With the RV, yeah. Chunks. Obviously no Chunks. Uh, H himself. Uh, Harj times two. Yeah. Harv, my favourite. Oh, really? Is yeah, he? Yeah. yeah my oh, favourite. Right. Yeah, yeah, Harv is the top. <laughs> Who does the love of? Manny. Rajiv. I was with him last week. Yeah. Um, Motorcycle we museum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Sam Taj and yourself. So how do I become a DJ? Can I just like, Andy, you're up? part of the family. You're... I don't know if anyone knows, but Andy is our uh, grandfather. He's my, I call him uh, Grandy as well, just like his own grandkids. He's, on, he's our on-site white dad. <laughs> <laughs> that tells us off. So how do you get to a stage where you've got 17 DJs and how do they uh, maintain the Kudos brand for you? So I think uh, that everyone, like you see the guys on the road, Andy, yeah? Yourself, you're the other side of it. I'm obviously not with the boys when they're, on gigs because I'm at my own gigs and I think you could probably play a testament to the fact that they all do a really good job all the with the brand with a lot of respect and I think a lot of people understand that like now you've seen the effort that and the premises and what we put together I think people res have to respect what we built here and what we've created um, and I think the boys are really just like myself are really grateful to be part of this entity that's like a um a very pioneering and forward thinking business. That's our main goal. Um, and I think the boys respect that. And I think that's why they are um, really 
kind of appreciative of what they're part of and when you go into a venue and people are like oh what company are you from and it happens to me every week oh we're from kudos oh right yeah yeah but if like people know who we are and that happens around the world not just here um and then also you have to remember i get every dj asking me to join this company every week and i can't take on everyone uh not just because we're being arrogant or anything like that but um again like the synergy amongst the staff I've got a synergy to protect amongst these boys where, you know, 17 DJs, there's not always 17 gigs. And it's just like a football team, you know, everyone wants to be on the team sheet first, you know, but not everyone can be Ronaldo. So you have to kind of remember those things as well. But the boys are wicked and there's a good level of a kind of a younger team and an older team. And I think they've got a really good respect for each other. Right. So you were talking there about um, Kudos being known worldwide. And obviously, we did uh, Kenya together. Um, apart from anything, you know, we've done a few abroad as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Kenya was probably the most notable one because the screen that you took was absolutely massive. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did you ship all that stuff out? I mean, the dance floor, all the printing, everything, or, or so it- we did. Anything that was kit, like in terms of technology, we hired from South Africa and a lot of surrounding companies. There was a really good AB company in Kenya that the family we helped the family find that had a lot of similar kit to us. Uh, It just didn't make sense to ship all our kit from there. Um, But we did all the LED screen we got from a company called Absin. So we invested into a brand called Absin who told us, oh look, this other company in South Africa has got exactly the same kit as you. So that kit got shipped in from South Africa to Kenya. But everything in terms of dance floor stages, um, build, print, we took six containers from here. Um, six 40 foot containers got sent over um, and yeah that kit all went over there and all our team went over and you saw the The logistics in in shipping six containers over and making sure they're in the right place at the right time uh, yeah yeah. and and not turning up late I mean you know who who dealt with that for you Hayton's brother Rajan he's the he's the he's the one that's uh, the the super organized one he's actually the brainiac in the whole team yeah so he's uh, he dealt with everything so Kudos is probably like you you alluded to it earlier. You know, you, you pioneer and you innovate and you try and move forward. Um, how does that title of pioneer sit with you? Are you, are you? Are you proud to do that? And and how do you aim to stay ahead of the competition? Because there are there are some yeah, tracking yeah. companies out there. So the main thing you got to look at, I think, if you keep looking around sideways, at what everyone else is doing, you can never look forward. So I always say to the boys, don't look sideways, look forward. You know, I always think of, like, for instance, Man United had the league, won the league for so many years and uh, Man City are winning the league for so many years. But if you actually look at their team, their team was never the same. They always changed up the team and became unpredictable and changed it up and, you know, brought in new players and obviously with the evolution of things like that. I don't know if that kind of makes me feel like you have to always keep on changing in our creative game. Um, And I think you you have to remember one thing, it's not even down to me. One guy that you have to respect, his vision is H. That guy pioneering, even with kudos, even everything you see in terms of the industry worldwide, this guy has got such a vision for it. Like I see setups that are around the world and I think, oh, we, we made this, we done this. We were the ones that started this. Um, you see it in the industry it is annoying don't get me wrong we'll do a setup one week and then next week some guy from Birmingham's copied it I'm not going to say who it is but who has copied it and you just think come on man we put a lot of effort into that you know we put like, at least wait five months or three months or at least a month before you rip it off and charge half price for it you know um, but it is the game man what can you do um, but H in terms of his pioneering skills in terms of like he so forward thinking like come on he he lays his guts out on the line uh where he's like oh jazz like when even like led dance floors we started off led dance floors yeah he's like oh look at these dance floors they've got these little lights in them company called grumpy joe's and we were like 22 years old no money he's like oh they're gonna cost 30 grand i was like 30 grand i ain't got 30 grand like to, to go in halves with you on that he's like now nah, let's do it done it for the how many years did you see led dance floors becoming industry standard became industry standard led screen h came around and said you know what forget these projectors forget this let's start putting led screen up at events now every single event you see 
what's that, an, an event, LED screen. That was H's idea. Um, print on dance floors, bespoke dance floors, all these things. Up, even uplighting around venues. These are things that we made big. We made them industry standard. And a lot of them come down to H's ideas. And the thing is, what you have to remember, forget the fact that, um, you know, people say, oh, yeah, you know, you copied us, you done that. People owe their whole business to that guy. Yeah. Their whole businesses that exist outside of this company because of things H introduced into the into our business, which Dave then said, oh, I'm going to do that. And that's down to H. I know I've been in the process where he's like, oh, let's go to this print show um, and see this massive flatbed printer. I was like, what the hell are we going to do with that? He's like, nah, trust me, we can print on any surface, we can do this. And then now you see print on dance floors everywhere. Yeah. Not in just this country, I'm talking all around the world. So you got to give it to that guy. I got to give it to him. Sometimes I sit back and I think, how did your mind work? You know, it's actually sometimes... I'm, I feel like, yeah, I'm blessed that, you know, we forget that he's my best mate, the fact that we're business partners because the guy's just so forward thinking. Yeah, yeah. So um, you were sort of saying as we were going around that weddings are probably not accounting for most of your uh, mm. turnover these days. So in terms of event production, um, yeah, sorry. So in terms of uh, event production, how do they push your business forward and do they help influence what the wedding work at all? I think what the being in the corporate side has enabled us to do is enabled us to make our working practice better, firstly, because I see some, you see it as well, Andy, you see some proper cowboy people um, and you just think, how the F did you get away with that? Like, I can't believe, I know our working practice the way we operate and working in venues like we're in-house in the Natural History Museum, there's only four companies in the whole country that can work there. And we're, we're this little company in Uxbridge and you've got Encore, who's one of the biggest production companies in the world, just across the street in the world, like massive, um, that didn't make the accreditation, but we did. Okay. Um, you know, you've got things like that that we have to respect that our working practice has become that good but what's enabled us to do as well is take that working practice to the weddings. And then the, the, the suppliers around you see that. You see our team on site. What I have to say is it, it, kudos. If you, if you come to a kudos event or a kudos designed event, what I've noticed is that, and it's just a tiniest little detail, but the edges of tables, you know, where you've got a table that, that's four or five inches thick or yeah. whatever, and the, the trim goes around the edge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and half the time, at, at most events, they're hanging off. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're not squared up properly to the corners. So your attention to detail is, yes. is absolutely on point. And I don't think there's 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 probably only other two companies that would probably get anywhere near to, to um, achieving that level of per perfection. And is that a testament to how you treat your staff, do you think? I think it's come down. I Look, the main thing you got to remember is it's not about treat your staff. It's about respecting the craft you're in. Everyone, look, everyone's going to have varying budgets, yeah? You can never knock someone's budget to someone else's budget. Someone might have a two grand budget. Someone might have a 15 grand budget. Some might have a 15, uh, 150,000 grand budget. But if you're going to deliver something to a customer, deliver it properly and enable our industry to get taken seriously like the Jewish industry does. Why do people still think, oh, Indian suppliers are not as finished and polished? Because they do bosh things together. Yeah. They do think, oh, we'll get away with that. They do have this, oh yeah, that'll be all right. That'll be all right until something happens where someone cuts their hand on uh, one of these tables or this or that and the venue has to then introduce regulation like I funnily enough I said this yeah I emailed the motorcycle museum one of my favourite venues uh, in August and I said to them look this supplier undercut me massively on this dance floor um, and I could just not do it at their price point now halfway through the event the dance so the dance floor acrylic just got double sided straight onto their carpet we don't obviously do that hence why you're so cheap now halfway through the event the dance hall starts coming up and the guests are coming up to me oh mate your dance hall's coming up i said that's not my dance floor like and they had to stop the wedding pull a couple of pieces of the dance floor up because it were bubbling up so much 
and put them to the side. So there was like two bits of, you know, like a Tetris thing where two bits of uh, dance were missing. I announced it on the mic. I said, as a, obviously you know what I'm like on the mic, I can get things with jest. Yeah. I said, ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, before you start putting this in the internet, that is not my dance floor. That is nothing to do with kudos. So just letting you know. Yeah, and then I carried on with the party, yeah? But the thing is, I emailed the Motorcycle Museum and I said, look, just to let you know, guys, this has happened. And for everybody associated now, the Motorcycle Museum are going to think, they're a big brand. They're going to think, well, hang on. Why don't our other suppliers and our other industries deliver work like this? If you want to be taken seriously, charge properly to the customer firstly, and then deliver a proper job. And then the venue will take you more seriously. So, Like now, I've been saying for ages, yeah? When you're rigging over people's heads, they're overloading the stuff. They're overloading the stuff. They're putting too much weight on this. There's no one managing it, yeah? Now, what's happened is, again, like the Motorcycle Museum, it's just because I've thought like this. It's my favourite venue. I'm not cussing it. But I'm just saying, what they've had to do now to protect themselves, they've had to introduce a rigging company in. Now, that client is now getting charged three grand on top just for rigging to hang their lights on top, which isn't the motorcycle museum's fault, but they've got to protect their reputation. If a light falls on someone or something falls down, that three grand to one customer is not going to be a headache for them. They need to protect their reputation. They could have a big court case or get sued on their head. And this cowboy company that can just close his limited business down, what are you going to do? So now who's, the, who's, who's failing? This, uh, who's actually at a problem is the customer now gets an extra three grand on their bill if they want to hang lights above their head. Yeah. And you're less likely to get the business now because you've got this extra three grand that the customer has to swallow. So it, bride A and groom B are deciding to get married and they're casting around. What do you think, um, you know, when they go down the directory and they get the name Kudos, uh, what do you think the public impression is? Um, I think, look, the main thing I always say to the boys is, look, anyone can put up equipment. Anyone can do it nowadays. You can hire and um, try hire companies to put your rig in for you and they'll and they'll do a job. We do it for people. We do it within other markets where we go and put the whole kit in. They'll bring their own DJ. I think our USP always has to be remain the same. It has to be the DJ. The point of contact comes from, I want Jazz Joha to do my party. I want DJ Harv's big smile at my event and doing my event. I want H's charisma at my event. I want Rajiv's mixing style at my event. It comes from that po- po- uh, kind of point. And I think that's our USP. Because I always say to everyone, yeah, the only people that experience your wedding with you is the DJ and the cameraman. No one else experiences your wedding with you. The caterer is in the kitchen. The decorator's gone home, your cake person's gone home, your uh, makeup artist has gone home, your car person's sitting outside, your coach person's sitting outside. The only people that actually go through the whole wedding with you is your DJ and your cameraman. And in order for your cameraman to have to create this amazing video for you and get really good shots, your DJ's got to be good. We're the only two people that experience the wedding. That's true enough, yeah. No one else does. Tell, and you know when people say, oh, you know, put your bar here or put your DJ to the side. I say, well, the decorator doesn't know about your event. They go home. Yeah. He's got his feet up watching Match of the Day or whatever while we're doing your event. So how does he know what your event's going to be like in the nicest way possible? Yeah. With Me and you are there, Andy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We are, yeah. Um, Manny Pablo sent a question. Oh, did he? He did. Why am I taller than him? <laughs> <laughs> not really I don't know actually I think you the are, two actually. most talented men in, in the industry Manny we're both short <laughs> his question you've been described as a master of your craft blending various genres and styles to create a unique atmosphere how do you keep your sets fresh and engaging while still catering to diverse audiences um, so like, going kind of repeating a little bit what I said before the DJ is the main thing yeah yeah it comes from the passion of music. Like for us, yeah, you got to remember, and this goes across the whole Asian wedding industry, just not my my DJs. Like this music knowledge is next level. Like you got to think, yeah, if you're, uh, I don't know, um, DJ EZ, Garage DJ, your amazing Garage DJ, what's your speciality you're known for is Garage, yeah? You're, and then if you're, um, I don't know, uh, a hip hop DJ, your speciality is hip hop. You're a house DJ. Your speciality. Our guys need to know everything. Think yeah, if you're doing a wedding where it's a mixture of this, 
our boys at a wedding, yeah, we'll play, we can play old school English music, we can play new school English music, which includes of hip hop, garage, house, R&B, and know it all. Then we've got Pongra music, which you got to know all the de- uh, all the ages from back in the day, the the different styles of Pongra music. Then Bollywood, you got to know this Bollywood music, that Bollywood music, Tamil music. You need to know, I don't know, wedding, a Nigerian and uh, Punjabi mix. I had to play Afrobeats, Nigerian, um, Pongra music, this, that. You got to know it all. You got to know all those musics. Um- so... Sorry, no. Yeah. For that for that particular wedding, is that knowledge stored upstairs and ready to, or did you just have to sit and do a little bit of research? It's a bit of both, I think, because obviously I've been doing this twenty two years. Yeah. My uh, ability to do different places and play um, different scenarios I've been thrown into has given me that kind of I've had to do that research and stuff back then. But let me tell you something: Asian wedding DJs, the knowledge they've got of music is incredible. I've gone to Christmas parties sometimes where I'm, they turn up and like, and it's like for a corporate client and they're like, who's this Indian geezer going to do our party? And I've absolutely annihilated that party and I'm playing all their, you know, 500 miles and this and that and all the old school Luther Vandross. That Nigerian wedding, with that Nigerian family were like, you know all this music. And the boy, I'm talking across Calibre, Ritzy, um, musical movements, us guys, Paragon, all of the DJs can play everything yeah. and people don't give themselves enough credit for how good they are. Can you, um, there's, there's a few of the questions on this pod that kind of just get repeated just by nature yeah, of, cool. of what it is. So um, can you remember the very first time where you probably got to the end of the gig and just thought, you know what, we've arrived, this is, this is the big time now? Um, I think every time I think I've done an event like oh, big time. I'm trying to think. But so, all right, let me let me put it in perspective. I think I've done weddings at Grosvenor House that've been the most incredible productions I've ever seen, and I think you might have done one with me. It was like a long where they set up the room long, quite a few years ago, and the party just didn't happen. Okay, the family just didn't have the love in the room that was enabled it to be a good party. Um, I mean, they put on a big spectacular show, but that's all it was. And then I've done parties for 150 people at Headsaw House where I've had the most incredible experience of my night and what, and the venue is saying, turn it off, turn it off. And I'm thinking, let me play. I've got two more, two more tracks, two more tracks. I'm looking, I'm thinking, oh, he's going to come over and tell me, to, I don't want this night to end because the party is so incredible. What was a better, for me as job, job satisfaction, what was better than quarter of a million pound production or this small little wedding I'd done but the crowd were next level and I had the best night of my life so it's a big balance man it comes with the passion yeah yeah I did, oddly um, so I did one with Harvard Woburn Abbey and probably 150 guests uh, I was filming for Jet Jag Pal I think and do you know what it was one of the best parties ever in fact I've had a tie on and it wound up hanging off my crane, you know, at the end of the kick. But that's what I'm saying to you. You can't buy, uh, oh man, sometimes I've done parties. Like I done a party last year, 11th of June. Uh, I still remember this party. And you know, the thing was the crowd, it was, I think it was like 60, 70 people for this bride that were left all the mates to the end. Maybe, maybe a hundred, I don't know. Party was so incredible. And you know what it does when you're DJing and you're playing to a crowd that's like, just wicked to play for you and just go off on this your mind just starts thinking and you start thinking oh I haven't played this in ages this will go down this will play I can play this and you become so experimental and that enables you to grow enables you to have fun the crowd to have fun and you're playing stuff that I haven't played in ages and I think yeah this is I walked away from that party thinking yeah that was amazing I love the uh, the spark you're getting in your eyes when, yeah, you're, yeah. when you're talking about this yeah, yeah. it's um just stepping away from DJing mm. specifically for a little bit. Mm. Um, if a couple approach you and they've got, you know, X budget, whatever it is, how do, who in your team, they come to you, right? And they yeah. say, oh, we want a floral garden theme or we want a, you know, an enchanted forest theme or we want this or we want that. How do you go about creating something uh, unique and uh, crisp and new for, for that couple? Or are... <laughs> So what I always say to couples is, is 
with Instagram now, there's a lot of pressure on everybody. There's a lot of pressure on the suppliers. There's a lot of pressure on the uh, people getting married uh, because nothing seems new anymore. People say to me, oh, I want something different. I'm like, different to who? And then I always ask the bride and groom, how many wedding cards did you get last year? How many wedding invitations did you get last year? And most people will say to you, two or three, max. I'm talking max. You actually get invited. Forget that me and you go to two or three weddings a week, Andy, yeah? How many weddings did you get invited to? And your network's huge. You're a known guy, yeah? Hmm. How, many, how many events did you get invited to last year? Like weddings? Maybe two? Uh, one? What, as a guest? Yeah. One. One, right. Most people get invited to two weddings a year. I said, so you're looking on Instagram because, and saying, oh, everything's the same because you're getting married. If you're building your house and you're decorating your house, what are you looking on Instagram for? Wedding house inspiration. So all of your pages and suggested pages are now wedding house inspiration. If you're buying a new car, well, all of a sudden, you're looking at cars that are, and you see so many, oh, I want to buy a BMW. You put, as soon as you pull out of the showroom, you think, oh, there's BMWs everywhere. Because you are looking for weddings, don't think, people go to two weddings a year, they're still going to be wowed. Like people say, oh, you know, door players, they, they, we see them every wedding. I said, yeah, but they're still amazing. Yeah, yeah. They're still amazing. You know when people say, oh, how do you keep your sets fresh? Um, yeah, we, s someone said this to me about um, the other Andy, my other white dad. Um, <laughs> oh, he always uses the same lines. I said, yeah, but... You only probably see him once every oh, four the years. Oh, the Toastmaster, Andy. Yeah, but yeah, we, yeah. we see him every week. Yeah. And I said, but you only probably, the customer only probably sees him once a year or once maybe even five years because not everyone has a Toastmaster. To them, Andy's the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. But that's his show. That's what Andy puts on. So it's like the door players, that's their show. Um, Chris, Christopher Williams, come on. Have you ever seen a sax player perform like him? Never. I, 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 oddly, I was working with a different sax player a few weeks ago. And I went over and I said, until you perfect the arched back and, and <laughs> play yeah. into the ceiling, you're, you're not even qualified, mate. Chris is a performer. You see him on stage. I think we're, we are spoilt because we get to see him all the time. If you see seeing Chris first time perform at a wedding, I'm thinking, wow, that guy is something else. And we're wowed by him every time we see him. Yeah, yeah. And we get to see him every week. These guys are performers. You know, and this is funny enough, going back to the conversation I had earlier. So Chris, um, obviously he's a close friend of ours. He used to be exclusive to Kudos. And after COVID, I said, Chris, you know what? Go and work for everybody. Go and make some money and go and work for everybody. Don't just rely on us because, you know, I want you to earn money. You've had a tough couple of years, yeah? Um, he said, you sure? I said, but one thing I want you to do, I want you to change your price. Ask him this. I want you to change your price from £350 and I want you to put it up to 1200 quid. And he said, nah, Jazz, I can't do that. I won't get booked. Ask him how much he's booked now and do people even moan about paying him that money? Does he bring that value to the event? Of course he does. Absolutely, he does. Yeah. He is something else. He's incredible, yeah? And he charges his worth now. Yeah. What people don't respect, yeah? And it's funny, I went to, uh, going off on a tangent, I went to see this uh, theatre show, uh, took my daughter, my wife, me, Krishna, and myself, to Gia, to um, this uh, circus show called Circus... 1940 something amazing most amazing show i've seen i was like wow and the host the ringmaster comes out and he said sat down in front of everyone he said you know this show that you watch today he said it's really good for you guys you walk away you clap and i'm really appreciative he said but well, one thing i want you to take away from today is that contortionist has been training since she was five years old that whatever uh, acrobat has been training for t trained for f seven hours a day for four years before they managed to even get a look in. So yes, yeah, great. And they getting, might be getting paid amazing money now, but look at their graft and what they put in to get to this point. And like Chris, he's probably learned how to play sax his whole life. You're not just paying for a DJ or a sax player. You're paying for someone who gives up every weekend away from his family, gives up every you know, uh, probably function that just like yourself, but that you don't get to go to and you have to say, oh, you know what? I'm booked that day. I can't come to the barbecue. I can't come to this. And you sit there looking at your Instagram thinking, oh, I missed out on this today. I missed out on the kids. I missed out on that. And you also get all the experience that that person is going to deliver you the best night of your life. For sure. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, so speaking about family life now, yeah, you're a dad. 
and a couple of kids. And so how do you manage family time? Because you've got two really young children to look mm-hmm. after. Um, your very beautiful wife. Yeah. Uh, and you're gadding off around the world going to Ibiza or, <laughs> or Delhi. Or... <laughs> Just cut this part. No, joking, yeah. <laughs> so I think one thing I've got a little advantage on is that um, Krishma's in the wedding industry as well. So all my friends that I come and talk to her about, let's say I saw, oh, I saw Andy on the weekend or I saw Didar Verdi or Amma and we were just talking about this. She knows exactly what I'm talking about because yeah. you're friends with, my, with Krishma yourself. Like you guys got your own mate, your, your own mates. So she feels like they're my friends as well. So when I, and she understands my industry and because our time schedules are similar. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm a little bit lucky on that respect that she hasn't got a nine to five Monday to Friday yeah. and her only time off is during the weekend. So the, I am a little bit blessed with that. But I think with the kids, um, you find the energy. Like last night I got home at what, 1.30 in the morning. Gia's bouncing around at 7 a.m. But for some reason you just don't feel tired yeah. when you see the smile walk in your room. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Do you think you're where you want to be within our industry or is there bigger and better things to come? I think as long as we grow as a whole industry, uh, one thing I would like to do is see regulation in our industry. I think that, why are we not a regulated industry? Talk to me. I mean like, for instance, yeah, every single industry is regulated and I see it within the corporate world because we're in that corporate world. There's no actual handbook of how to deliver a job. And I always say, so I, with a customer, one thing you have to do, they're not protected by anything. A customer's not protected. You're handing your money over and we're talking thousands and thousands of pounds to clients and suppliers. And on the day, you just got the risk. If a builder comes to your house and bodges up your bathroom, you can tell him to knock it down and redo the bathroom or phone another builder and say, look, this really crap builder messed up my house. But if you're booking a supplier that's showed you a really good Instagram page, which if you're no not like a no uh, like a not a a newbie to this, and you haven't had previous experience with suppliers or recommendations, you're just trusting that person and what they're showing you on a laptop and telling you what they can deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think the issue you've got, you're spending. This is how we brief our staff. Yeah. Once you've had the caterer, the venue, the decorator, the DJ, the outfits, the cake, the makeup, the this, the that, the this, you're spending 100 grand on a reception? But the videographer, photographer, this, that, 100 grand, you add everyone's bills together, yeah? Now, most weddings, what time do the guests walk in in an evening reception? Seven o'clock. Yeah. And they leave at one, yeah? So you've got eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, six hours at 100K. So what's that, about 15 grand an hour? Yeah. 15,000 pound an hour you're spending on your venue, on your event, yeah? And some people are like, oh, you know, we, we only ran 20 minutes late. I only ran half an hour late. No, you just cost the customer seven and a half grand. So. That's a very valid point. I'd not thought of it in those terms. Yeah, actually, so you just, co- you're better off spending on the better supplier that's going to staff your job properly, deliver your job properly and have a proper team to come in and do it because it's a false economy. Saving your two grand from the next guy. How many events have me and you been at and someone's not ready? Yeah. And you're standing there waiting for them and you can't get your room shots and we're all standing there and, you know, Shirley from Ragamamas is going mental because the event, uh, because she wants to get her guests in because we're messing up her time plan now for her food. Um, and this supplier is not d- delivering their job. There needs to be some regulation. I really thought that the Asian Wedding Association was a brilliant, brilliant idea. It just wasn't executed right. Okay. Um, I approached the DJs and said, look, let's do a DJs association, but no one wants to commit to better pract- working practice. Hmm. So where your dance was are laid better, your cu- customers are being given a better product, but unfortunately you're going to have to charge a little bit more. But you're actually giving the customer, this, they're not spending more money. They're, when I said they're losing that seven grand or six grand if you're 10 minutes late, they're not spending more money. It's a false economy. Well, it, it, because, you know, you buy cheap, you buy twice. Generally, yeah. you know, if you buy a piece of it, if I buy a, a cheap mm. tripod, uh, six months later, I've got to replace it. Because exactly. It, it well, the thing is, apart. you can rebuy that. A wedding, you get one shot at it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. This is my whole point about the builder thing. Yeah. As you look around the industry, is there anyone else apart from H? Because you're just mm. going to go to H for this. But is there anybody else that, that properly inspires you? Oh, there's loads of people, loads of people. You've got to look at, 
for instance, like people like Sanjay and Andy, yeah, created the industry for everyone, made us more serious. We were, I, I've been in this since we were doing school halls, since we were doing leisure centres, and weddings in a hotel were uh, a big deal. Like to do a wedding at the Radisson Edwardian on Bath Road was like wow. Yeah. At the Thistle Hotel and Heathrow, wow. Now the Thistle is not considered a desirable place to do, like a for a big wedding. It's more like a pre-wedding place, yeah. But you got to give it to the guy. He is an inspiration. The fact that he is an MBE or whatever, yeah, he deserves it. He created an industry. You got to look at creators. Zibby from uh, Dream Occasions, yeah? Come on, you got to give her her props. Things that she does change the whole industry. She comes in, and I remember she did the centerpiece at my wedding, yeah? It was like a tall thing with a big circle on the top. That changed the whole game. She come and done that. You know, she's she's a pioneer. She's got an idea for it. But there's so many people like that. They're just two people that come to mind. You know, like they allowed us into the access to the wedding. The wedding's taking us into the hotels, yeah, and changed up the game for us. Zibby's changed up the decor game. H has changed up the um, the DJ game. Even Suki from Calibre, they're one of my main competitors. I joined his company, but he was a professional outfit. The lessons I took from him, I'm actually grateful I ended up at Calibre. I, I never look at that journey and think, oh, you know, Calibre, they're my competitor. No, nah, he was a professional guy. He tried to run it as a professional outfit, which we took our lessons from as we were part of them and then made our own company. Not because we hated being part of him. We just wanted to do our thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he got to give it to him. The guy ran it as a proper business and he's long, he st stood the t uh, test of time. Um, you got to, yeah, you got to look around and think that these people have done a good job. And they've inspired loads of other companies to exist. What would you say is, um, looking back across all the thousands and thousands of weddings that, that uh, you've done, even without me being there, um, what's the pinnacle? Um, what, in terms of production or just... M yeah, just overall, you... you I've got to say this, right, uh, the Candola wedding a few months ago. Oh, next level, yeah. I walked into that room um, and I said to Ricky, it's not often these days that I walk in a room and go, bloody wow. Yeah. But that was one of them. And that's so unusual these days to walk, for, because we we all sort of get jaded with seeing, this, seeing the same tables, yeah. the same centerpieces, the same this, the same that, in a different, uh, you know, just in a different order yeah, <laughs> or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But that room, uh, and H was there kind of overseeing everything, just yeah. making sure it was all it was all good. Uh, and it absolutely blew me away. It was fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. you know, is is there one that you look back at? I don't, you weren't there at that one, were you? I think every stage enables you to push to the next thing. You know, like when we first released our first rig with the two t plasma screens and the two projectors, we were like, whoa, this is, look at that. We're kudos. Like, but then you got to evolve. You can't just hold on to that. The next thing is if you, I always believe if you focus on the customer, and what the customer and creating something cool for the customer, you'll still grow your business. Your 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 growth comes from the desire and passion to deliver something new and um, innovative. Innovative. I know I hate that word, but innovative for the game. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I just because everyone's like, oh, be innovative. Yeah, let's put that in our bio. Uh, but yeah, um, but I just think you know, like to change up the game again. I think the passion to deliver and love for events enables you to create industry, create new things. And I think the love for the client's feeling, you know, when you see a customer look come in and they're like, wow, that's all makes your job worth it, isn't it? Yeah. I, and I mean, yeah. when, the, when, when Ricky walked, I'm sure he was blown away at that. At yeah. That yeah. Wedding. And it wasn't even his wedding. It was his sister's wedding. Yeah. But still. Yeah. I think, you know, for every customer, you got to achieve, you got to respect that everyone has a different budget and what everyone's top end budget and what they've given their hard earned money for, even if it's five grand or 10 grand or a million pound to that person, you got to respect that money that they've handed to you and still deliver the level of effort, regardless whether you're just putting up a simple DJ setup. Sure. So um, final question, which I've asked everybody and you can't cop out by saying the same thing. Mm. Um, if I could give you the uh, tools, the skills, the knowledge to do any other single job within the wedding industry, what would you do? Um, that would be enable us to be this 
creative and fun. You know what I would probably do? I really enjoy cooking. So I'd become a chef. Really? Yeah, I love cooking. Like, I, so Poonam from Madhu's, over COVID, I think what she done, because we weren't being able to DJ, to get our kind of creative, you know, desire, <laughs> like give me something creative to do. Yeah. We all went into cooking. Like H, and, especially me and H, and Chonks as well. Um, we kind of delved into cooking. And Poonam used to teach us over the phone and over FaceTime. Wow. And we used to have like cooking lessons with her. And she used to be... Ten, ten, so now I'm like really into cooking. Like Krishma never cooks at home okay. because she's just like, you know what? You love it. You do it. I, I, I love cooking for the family. And like even my mum and my family will come over sometimes and I'll cook. Even today, we've got guests coming over later. I've been up since first thing this morning, prepping everything, putting stuff in the oven. Um, I think, yeah, I, th- I actually appreciate now... Uh, good food it's funny I had this conversation with Arjun the other day because Arjun's knowledge of food for uh, from Madhu's his knowledge of food is so so big and he was like um, talking to me about some uh, other dishes and like uh, just talking generally about industry stuff I said the thing is Arjun I said only now I understand flavour um, to me a, ch- a lamb curry was a lamb curry before I don't know it, may- it tasted nice or it tasted bad yeah. that's it I said but now you understand the palate. Like, for instance, I know, oh, there's too much salt or there's too much, you know, cor- not coriander, but there's too much garam masala or there's too much this or too much that. And I think, um, yeah, I think I probably would go into food if I, or being a cook or do something to do with food. Fantastic. I wouldn't like to do your job. I think you lot got the hardest job. <laughs> no, it's easy. No, the ca- you have the gym. Oh, the gym's, uh, the, gym, the gym's got an easy job. But no, I'll give it, you, listen, let me tell you something. I done a wedding at the Fairmont a couple of weeks ago, yeah? I walked in, six o'clock, rolled in with my laptop. These boys, cameramen, they'd been there since the morning doing the makeup shots, the mund up shots, the turnaround, the this, the that, the reception. Then they leave, yeah? You guys are the first awake and the first and the last home. And when the food came out, I always say to my lot, look, let them eat first. Because you lot have been on your feet running around and uh, you got to respect the cameraman. That, that doesn't work though because the drummers always get there first. Yeah, and they, oh, they've been on site for so long. <laughs> those, uh, those, dr- those door players, yeah. Listen, man, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's, um, I really appreciate you coming in on this bank holiday and just oh, uh, just giving me an hour of your... Just uh, everyone know, time. Andy asked me first, yeah? I just longed him out of it. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, f- I'm full of cult. So, so I Andy, I want to ask it. you something back, yeah? Oh, sugar. Um, yeah. So... You're in the industry of, you know, full of uh, varying suppliers. You get to see different things. What do you think the industry needs? What do you think it needs? Or do you think that, you know what, we should just appreciate what we got? Higher standards. Yeah? Higher standards is is the thing. Um, I did, I've done so many weddings where, uh, and you've sort of talked about this today mm. as well, um, slop dosh, that'll yeah. do, that'll do. Um, I took a photo, and I do, I tweet yeah. them because I'm, I'm terrible, but I can't bear it. That somebody put a, a red carpet down, like a walkway carpet. Yeah. Stains all over it. Yeah. To cover the stains up, they put flower petals on. Yeah. So I kicked the flower petals to one side, took a picture, and, oh, what are you doing? You can't, you know, I said, well, change it, because they've paid you for this carpet. They want new carpet. They don't want second-hand carpet. There's, um, you know, things like that. Um, these stands that go in the middle, I did one at Southampton, uh, a GS Bowl. And uh, table centres, uh, and it got gold um, box around the around the centre. That, that yeah, you know, the support, uh, and they were all wonky and falling apart and not stuck together properly. And it's just like, come on, you know, just polish it up a little bit. That's all you need to do. These people are paying you a huge amount of money. Yeah, do you, and do you think that ultimately comes from the fact there's no regulation, there's no handbook of stuff? Like, imagine, let's say, yeah, Jay and I. Uh, uh, Chanted by Saima, uh, the big big guns in essential. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to think of names. I'm not trying to uh, say anyone's better than anyone else or Dream Occasions or whoever it is. Yeah. All the big guns got together the, the, and they formed a handbook and said, "Look, guys, you know we're going to operate in this way. This is how you should lay a carpet. This is how you should do this. I should do that." Even the DJs, like I seen LED screen get hung up. Their counter support was their cases cable tied to the truss now until the day that led screen falls on someone's head and kills someone it becomes viral 
people are just going to keep getting away with it. But there's, there's always that one day that it happens. The trouble is there's nobody to police uh, that sort of, you know, if you, if you had that handbook yeah. on, on how to do things, there's no one there to police it. And ultimately, um, it's like driving... It's like driving down the M1. There's going to be people doing 100 miles an hour, even though the limit's 70. But if we had, let's say, all the DJs, all the production companies came together and we said, look, guys, we're going to have this handbook that we all agree to and we all do get this, let's say, DJ association stamp. Yeah. And then when the customer sits with you, you say, oh, look, we're, oh, okay. we're, we're, we're accredited by the DJ association. Us, Ritzy, uh, um, Paragon, Calibre, all of us, we're, we've formed this alliance. At least you've got that guarantee that this is how we lay our dance floors. This is how we put our lighting yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I think we need. Yeah. We need, but no one wants to commit to it. And I, I just don't know why. Maybe we should. I think, um, I think actually, yeah, it would be a good thing. Um, like a quality seal like a, yeah yeah definitely because the caterers have to do it they have to go through Hilton accreditation they have to go through all these accreditations where their food safe look think how many people you're catering for you've got to make sure you've got food healthy safeties and all the rest of it so they have to go through it we should go through it as well anyway we should change this to moaning with Andy and Jazz <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking we put, put the road to light uh, put... nah, nah. listen ultimately I would say it's an amazing industry to be in um I'm very grateful for the life it's given me, the places I've been able to see, and more importantly, the people I've become friends with. That includes suppliers and clients alike. Yeah. Because we would have never been able to forge those relationships without this this industry. So you've got to be grateful for it. That's a great one to end on. Cheers, man. Wicked. Appreciate your time. Thanks. <laughs> So there we go, uh, 50 good solid minutes of chat from Jas and um, some interesting points made, particularly in regard I think to um, generally trying to raise standards across the entire industry, be it DJs, decor, um, whatever the um, service sector is, maybe um, sorting out some sort of um, code of practice, you know, that people abide by and then get a little crest to display, uh, you know, or some, I don't know, British standard, whatever. It's um, interesting, interesting, interesting. Any views on that, please um, let us know, uh, either on the Facebook page or just drop me an email, andy at jibstv.com, J-I-B-Z-T-V.com. Um, same email if you're an industry professional yourself and you'd like to um, take part. Um, uh, happy to um, welcome you aboard um, and uh, well let's see uh, I've not recorded the next episode yet we're still at the beginning of May um, this episode I think is going out the first week of June or maybe the second so um, I have got a few lined up um, and uh, hopefully um, they'll be in the bag by the time you get around to listening to this one so uh, we'll see you on the next pod episode 7 and no idea who it is. Dot, dot, dot. To be confirmed. See you soon. Thanks for listening. Bye. Um, I'll give you one. How about how big's the box you stand on behind? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, mean, you see, I, just, I just made one. <laughs> These not made me a specific box. I wish I took a picture of it because <laughs> I was sick and tired of me standing on the crate. <laughs>